Southern Illinois is an interesting area where we have the northern range limit of bald cypress tupelo swamps. Bald cypress tupelo swamps are typically associated with the southeastern United States, and it's a very imperiled type of habitat. We also have unique ephemeral wetlands. Ephemeral wetlands are seasonal wetlands that fill in the, the late winter, early spring. They provide a wealth of habitat for a number of different species. When you're down here, it really feels like you're in the southern portion of the United States. As someone who grew up in northern Illinois, I didn't even know that this existed until I started working at the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, NGREC. So the mission of NGREC is to study the big river ecology, the watersheds that feed them, and the human communities that depend upon them. And so what my program focuses on is the watersheds that feed those bigger rivers. And when we think about watersheds, the first thing we should think of are wetlands. Why do we care about wetlands? Well, one, they're nature's natural sponges. They help with flooding. Additionally, wetlands are thought of as Earth's kidneys. They naturally filter out a lot of the pollutants in the water systems that we have. And then most importantly, well, most importantly, at least in my eyes, this project, they are extremely diverse ecosystems. Starting approximately 10 years ago, the National Great Rivers Research Center got involved in research in the southern portion of Illinois through my wildlife ecology research program. The way we got involved with that was a study on amphibian and reptile diversity in the Cache River system. So in partnership with colleagues at the Illinois Natural History Survey and funding from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we conducted what we call status surveys. Status surveys document the occupancy or occurrence of species at a particular site. We focused on these unique bald cypress tupelo swamps, and we sampled approximately 30 different swamps across the Southern Illinois area. Through that project, we found sites with bird voice tree frogs. Bird voice tree frogs are a state threatened species, and again, they are uniquely connected to bald cypress tupelo swamps. And so they are actually an indicator of bald cypress tupelo swamp health. So bird voice tree frogs are very particular. They're habitat specialists, meaning they only can be found in bald cypress tupelo swamps. That is what they love. That is the only place that you're gonna find them. Some other frogs we find here, like green tree frogs or gray tree frogs, they're what we call habitat generalists, where we'll find them here, but they also can live anywhere else. So you can see that both of these frogs, very similar looking and coloration, this is actually a gray tree frog, and this is a bird voice tree frog. How we can tell the difference for this is that they have different color flash patterns. So bird voice tree frog have that iridescent green, where gray tree frog complex has this really vibrant yellow orange color. Bird voice tree frogs, on the back of their leg, they have what we call a flash pattern. That flash pattern is a bright green, and so for an otherwise relatively gray frog, it has this hidden green color. That flash pattern scares predators, and so as a predator approaches, they quickly flash that green, the predator gets slightly confused, and they can hop away unharmed. So if you see a tree frog around your home, you're likely seeing a gray tree frog because these are habitat generalists and they could live anywhere for the most part, and they're not intolerant to permanently flooded conditions, where bird voice tree frogs are intolerant to permanently flooded conditions and need to have these more pristine swamp habitats. The significance of this project is that we are assessing restoration success. And so what we have is sites that are more pristine, i.e. natural, and sites that are degraded. What we want to know is how well those degraded sites are recovering through the restoration efforts of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, U.S. Forest Service, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The reason that we would use frogs 
is because amphibians have a unique life cycle. And that life cycle is what we call biphasic, which means two phases. The first phase is in that tadpole stage that they're going to be in the water. As you can imagine, when an animal is exposed to water with semi-permeable skin, such that those tadpoles have, they will uptake any type of pollution in the environment. And so they can tell you about the health of the water itself. Once the frogs metamorphose, they're reliant upon the terrestrial habitat. And the terrestrial habitat has the same types of issues that the aquatic habitat will have. And so those frogs, again, with their semi-permeable skin, will be indicators of overall ecosystem health. So the ultimate goal for the bird voice tree frogs, which we're gonna see today, is to improve their habitat and thus improve their population numbers. We're here to go check some traps for these bird voice tree frogs. The traps we use are PVC traps. So a lot of people think when they hear the word trap, that means that the individual, or the frog in this case, is physically trapped in there and cannot come or go as it pleases. So these are actually passive traps, meaning that they can come and go as they please. The passive trap is made up of three pieces of PVC pipe. We have a cap at the bottom, we have a main tube of the PVC pipe, and we have a collar. And these are connected to the trees with two bungee cords. Trap 20 is clear. Why the frogs like these PVC traps is that it will fill up with water only to that first collar, and then it will, so the whole thing will not get flooded. And so it creates this dark, damp place that is just tree frog heaven. We have all of the animal care permits to be able to do this, and as well as the state and federal permits that go along with land access. And the frogs themselves will experience no discomfort. So we have 10 sites in Southern Illinois that we're looking at. We have some in the Cache River system and some in Eastern Shawnee. We go out to these sites and we have 50 traps per site for a total of 500 traps that we check every single time we come down here, which is roughly bi-weekly or uh, once a month, depending on the time of year that we're here. And here's the number, 3-1. So put 3-1 on the bag. Okay. Okay. Sometimes he wants to go. Yeah. bird voice tree frog? Uh, yep. One of the techniques that we will use is what we call pit tagging. Pit tagging is a passive integrated transponder that's about the size of a grain of rice. It's what your dog or cat would get at the vet, so if they get lost, they can scan them with a reader and they can bring them back to you. Well, we do a similar thing with the frogs, and so there'll be a small syringe that inserts, but remember, they have an anesthetic, and so just like when you go to the doctor and you have some type of minor procedure, they get that as well. First checking the captured frogs from the swamp we were just in to determine if they have that pit tag. For frogs that don't have that tag, those will be the frogs that will go under an anesthesia. The anesthesia is just a, a light water-based solution uh, with a little bit of benzocaine that helps numb them up for the pit tagging process and it also allows us to handle the frogs without harming the frogs. So right now we can see Melissa has just placed uh, the first frog, which is a, a green tree frog, Hylus scenario, into the anesthetic solution and it'll take approximately three to five minutes before that frog uh, will slow down. Once the frog has been pit tagged, it will be measured with a hand ruler and then weighed on a portable digital scale uh, to get those demographic measurements and we'll determine the sex, whether it's male or female. Bird voice tree frogs, in addition to having the toe pads, and those toe pads help them climb into the canopies of the tree above us and back down to the water that they'll need for reproduction, but they have a frog call. So the males, when they're courting the females, will have this high-pitched whistle. Hence the name bird voice tree frog. And so you'll hear this whistling chorus throughout the forest on nice calm days. During the day, that's all you'll hear. During the breeding season, his vocal pouch would be more kind of grayed out because it'd be able to, for breeding calls and for the breeding season. But now as we're moving more into the fall, winter, it's no longer breeding season. They no longer have that kind of discoloration along their throat. Um, so it looks very similar to how females look. However, we could still tell that this is a male. 
by looking at his yep. little hand. It's always reaching out to me. But his little thumb pad here has this kind of extra enlarged pad right there. However, that can also start becoming a bit absorbed after the breeding season. So at some point it does become very difficult in order to sex them at all. We have to put unknown down. And usually if there we do recapture that individual in the later season, during their breeding season, where we really know the sex, we're able to kind of go back and correct for the information. They can change color with both temperature and their environment. So this one is a little bit more brown, but has green marking also on its back. It's very unique. They all have very unique colors that will kind of pop up with them. So they've been measured for the SVL and their weight in grams, and we drop them in the, the coordinated water. And the reason we're able to put all these guys in here is because we release them as a full transect. So while we were wanted to know what individual traps they came from if they were recaptures, now when we release them, we kind of just place them out into the middle of that transect or the area where we had those traps. We'll kind of just let them all go and um, they'll be able to find their way. The whole process for an individual frog is less than five minutes. Um, they don't feel any type of pain during that process. They'll come back to, they'll start hopping around and we'll take them back to the swamp. Release. Outside of our Big River System water quality work we do at Angrek, this is a really great example of how we're working with the lands that feed them, the watersheds, the basins that feed that those larger Great River systems. These swamps are internationally important and the frogs that live in these swamps are state threatened. So the work that we're doing here is really critical to ensuring the protection and the longevity of the species of bird voice tree frog as well as these swamps. Oh, wait. Nice. You have one? Got him. Bird boys, thank you. Come on, bud. There he is. This project is significant to Angrex's mission because it helps us better understand communities and species that utilize these watersheds, these river basins, and these great river systems. We just want people to know that these species exist, bird voice tree frogs exist, these beautiful habitats exist, and they need our help. Ultimately, the point of any research is to develop information that can be used by policymakers, land managers, and people in charge that are making those decisions. And so we can provide that type of information. That's where we see the biggest gains when we have research-based organizations such as the National Great Rivers Research Center working in collaboration with institutions such as the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And so through that joint partnership, we are able to evaluate and subsequently update these conservation plans on a regular basis. I'm so grateful to be able to work for NGREC because every single day I'm given the opportunity to go to such beautiful places like this one for my work with NGREC, able to work with such a diverse amount of collaborators, students, individuals who generally would never get the opportunity to be able to work in these locations, as well as be able to learn just a large amount of different skill sets to really be an amazing scientist, to be a better scientist. If being in a place that really cares about moving science to policy, really making sure not only does it get to the hands of policymakers or the Department of Natural Resources, but that we do our outreach, that we get that to the people of the community to get them to understand why they should care about not only the bird voice tree frogs in this specific system, but all the research that we do. And we integrate that into curriculum in schools around the area. We go to all these amazing outreach events to get that information to the public and just being able to see the public get so excited learning about species and habitats that they never knew existed and me being able to kind of spark that curiosity in them is just amazing and I'm, I'm really thankful every single day that I get to be working at EGREC.